uh, thank you, Kathy, for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, today we are going to uh, talk about prevention of heart disease. Uh, this is a very uh, under-addressed topic um, in both um, medical offices as well as hospitals, uh, where um, there is a lot of focus on uh, the new novel therapies for cardiovascular pathologies and diseases. And uh, uh, even if you, when you go to conferences, uh, uh, everybody wants to talk about the latest and the greatest uh, uh, of the treatment modalities, whether it is stents or balloons we use. Uh, but there is uh, less focus on the simple uh, strategies uh, which help in a long way uh, in uh, preventing heart disease. So we are going to talk briefly about those today. Um, uh, I would uh, encourage everyone to um, uh, ask questions uh, towards the end of the meeting. If uh, there are any doubts, then I'll be happy to answer them. So these are some facts which are true about uh, the burden of cardiovascular disease in our country, it is the leading cause of death. Uh, one in three Americans die of cardiovascular disease. There is about uh, 2,300 per day, which means there's a death uh, um, every 38 seconds. This is more than all forms of cancer and respiratory illnesses combined, uh, including uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, other cancers, as well as the COPD, which itself has a a uh, big burden on our healthcare system. And uh, approximately every 40 seconds an American will die, will have a heart attack. Not die, will have a heart attack. Uh, this is an expensive deal uh, for our uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid services and the direct and indirect cause of uh, heart disease uh, in 2013, that was the latest I could uh, find was uh, close to $300 billion. Uh, which uh, sometimes is actually the gross domestic products of uh, some smaller countries. So it is a big deal. Um, if, they, if you see the CDC data <clears throat> for uh, prevalence of uh, uh, diseases in our community, you can see that more than half of the population um, has uh, coronary heart disease, which means uh, uh, arteries, heart arteries having blockages, producing either heart attacks or significant symptoms requiring therapy. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, the other vascular diseases, be it high blood pressure, disease of arteries, stroke, uh, congestive heart failure, they are all combined under the heart disease umbrella, but uh, the burden of uh, the, <clears throat> the most burden of pathology is just blockages in the heart arteries. Um, uh, why, why do I, there is a reason I have included this, uh, this slide, uh, and uh, to be honest, I made this presentation um, uh, before uh, COVID, I've, I've used this presentation a lot, and uh, um, in, in, in medieval times, there were certain diseases and there were certain epidemics which were considered of, of astronomical proportions. They, are, they were mentioned in, uh, uh, you know, Vedic literatures, biblical uh, writings, that those were the epidemics which, were, which claimed a lot of life. Um, as a modern society, we uh, don't understand that with the amount of people being affected by cardiovascular diseases currently in our country and also in the world as a whole, the burden of this particular disease is almost reaching those levels. But just because we don't see people dropping like that flies in and around us, we don't realize that the, the burden is uh, so great, so uh, monumental. But when you have 50% of the population in developed countries affected by a certain disease, it is almost like having plague or smallpox uh, in previous centuries, which were considered and still are authored as 
uh, you know, the healthcare crisis of all times. Um, obviously, with COVID-19, uh, that is one of the, um, uh, another new parameters we can compare it with. We can see how many deaths and how many uh, hospitalization happened with COVID-19, and you can uh, interpret cardiovascular disease data in that light and still see that there are a lot of any hospitalizations over a year uh, in uh, burdening our Medicare system, burdening our hospital uh, uh, inpatient stays, uh, but still we don't realize that this problem has to be deal dealt with uh, aggressively. Um, so, so don't undermine the burden of cardiovascular disease as the um, moral of the story of this slide. So I've included about five or six slides here just to, um, these are very basic slides, so I'm gonna quickly go over that. Um, heart is an important organ, as all of us know. The main function of the heart is, a, is, is to pump blood. It does that on an average 70 to 80 times a minute for our lives. And uh, for it to efficiently do it, the heart muscle needs to get um, a blood supply, which is adequate and can meet the demands of the body as well as the heart at different times. So if somebody is going up a flight of stairs, Obviously, the heart pump needs to pump out more blood. The heart muscle has to be healthy enough to meet that demand and uh, obviously pump out the oxygen rich blood to other uh, body parts. Uh, when you start having uh, cholesterol plaques uh, uh, complicated with certain fatty cells, certain macrophages, certain uh, inflammatory material, and those deposits start to build up inside the uh, heart arteries, we call it coronary artery disease. Uh, two major things can happen with that. First, if the plaque continues to worsen, it can decrease the blood flow to the heart muscle, which will cause significant symptoms. Um, most of those symptoms happen when the demand is more, when the people are exerting, they feel more shortness of breath, more chest pain. And second thing, if any even if the plaque is not very significant, but it ruptures due to any given circumstances, whether it is a spike in high blood pressure, emotional stress, physical stress, uh, that that ruptured plaque can cause a clot inside the heart arteries, resulting in 100% decrease of blood supply to the heart muscle, causing acute heart attack. So sometimes people have progressive symptoms. Sometimes people have acute heart attack, but it is all on a big spectrum of coronary artery disease acting up in one way or the other. So there, there is a uh, there's a you know myth in our society that heart disease or blockages can only happen in old ages. That is not true. It starts from very uh, I shouldn't say that even toddlers have heart blockages, but it. The, the whole process that body's ability or the body's mechanism to deal with extra fat, extra cholesterol, unhealthy uh, diet we take is to form deposits which are typically on the inside of the arteries. And that process starts at two years um, and then continues to progress, but it really accelerates in the fourth, fifth, sixth decade of life causing um, problems. So um, what increases risk? There are some things which we can help, some things we cannot, we cannot change our the aging process, our gender, uh, family history, but we can modify a lot of risk factors and we are gonna talk about those at length. Uh, we'll start with cholesterol. Uh, it is a type of a fat. Our body produces enough cholesterol by itself that we don't need to consume more, but um, no matter what we say, every food we eat has um, a cholesterol, um, a certain amount of cholesterol in it. Obviously, if you eat um, more unhealthier foods, uh, the deposit uh, mechanism, the whole process is accelerated beyond comprehension. And we have seen people even in their 30s, 40s uh, on a really unhealthy diet uh, to have significant plaque burden. There have been multiple studies done uh, 
from Mayo Clinic, uh, Harvard, where they have just um, seen that people who have had um, diet rich in uh, red meats, diet rich in uh, uh, fried food, uh, their plaque burden is uh, objectively higher than people who have had plant-based diets. Uh, where does it come from? As you can see, uh, our liver, our body generates a lot of cholesterol as well, but then about 35% of the times it's from our diet. Um, the LDL cholesterol is known to be a bad cholesterol and um, serves as the basic primer of those uh, cholesterol deposits under in our arteries. HDL cholesterol or high-density cholesterol uh, can clear up those um, uh, fatty plaque, um, and uh, it is uh, the higher the HDL cholesterol, is, that's better. It is typically higher in women, and it increases with exercise and uh, healthier lifestyle. Um, the second one, obviously, you know, it is uh, cigarette smoking. This is one of the most preventable causes of hospitalization, causes of death, causes of uh, cardiovascular pathology, um, you know, uh, the the paradigm has really shifted in the last uh, 60, 70 years where um, uh, about in 1960s, uh, there used to be a lot of marketing behind promoting cigarette smoking. And uh, this is one thing where our society uh, has made a lot of advancements and uh, uh, in general, the, the message is very clear that everybody uh, needs to quit smoking and there is increased burden, which is directly proportional. It is, it is linear. The more you smoke, the more risk um, you are at. Um, diabetes, it is uh, uh, the disease in which uh, uh, we have higher blood sugars. There are a lot of mechanisms to it. Type 1 diabetes in which people don't make insulin. Type 2 diabetes in which uh, the body makes a little too much glucose on its own and does not process our foods well. Nevertheless, it is one of the major uh, risk factors for heart disease, stroke, and, and vascular disease in general. Uh, a diabetic is more likely to die of a heart attack than non-diabetics. And uh, there is uh, almost a one is to one uh, correlation. We see that people uh, who eventually have died a heart attack in their sixth, seventh, eighth decade of life, if you uh, investigate them a little in detail, you will find that most of them have either diagnosed or sometimes undiagnosed diabetes. Um, they, they come in with a acute event, and that is the first time they realize that, oh, they've had diabetes for. Uh, a long time. Um, this is another problem our country has, um, which is obesity. We, in general, um, there is uh, data which suggests that the average uh, weight and the average body mass index of our um, uh, our community, and by community I mean not Quad Cities, not Illinois, but in general. Uh, our, the, the population of our country has increased phenomenally in the last um, 20 years. There is a lot of uh, um, reasons to that, uh, decreased activity, um, increased uh, working at the desk, uh, uh, less um, uh, physical work, whether it is in the plants, in the countries, a lot of reasons, but in general, we have... Uh, um, we have uh, gotten unhealthier uh, and uh, uh, are way more than what we should. Um, alcohol consumption, uh, there is uh, not a lot of data which says directly alcohol consumption affects heart disease. Um, and uh, there is actually some data which suggests that mild to moderate consumption might, uh, might even benefit um, vascular health in general. Um, not that I'm suggesting everyone should have a, a cocktail every night, but what happens with alcohol consumption is that it generally promotes unhealthier habits. So you end up eating a lot of wings at a party, you end up eating a lot of fried food in it, and generally people uh, tend to uh, have higher blood pressures uh, the night off or the day after 
have consuming a large amount of alcohol so um so it is uh, it affects heart health in a lot of other ways uh long term chronic excessive use of alcohol does promote heart failure there is an entity called as alcoholic cardiomyopathy where uh, the heart will dilate and the heart will get weak in people who have had a lot of alcohol over the years Uh, so there is a very fine line um where we say the alcohol is good versus the alcohol is bad so the the idea about discussing today's presentation is that uh, a we need to know what are good choices what what can we do to make things better for us better for our family and what and those the our kids can see us practicing those things so that it becomes a habit for them but the more important part is um a very important message i want to give today is that whatever we do whatever changes we make we have to make in a way that they are sustainable um it shouldn't be the fact that oh we heard a uh a presentation by one doctor saying on prevention of heart disease and we are all motivated but that um and we are going to take such screen uh, extreme steps uh that those changes last only a week or a month so whatever we do we, we all got to live we all got to uh, you know we have a society we have to be a part of so uh, i love my beer and wings once every two weeks i every one of us should have and uh i also have a scoop of white ice cream here and there but we have to make changes or healthier uh habits uh in a way that we can practice them for a long time so heart in heart disease uh you know uh, there there is a there is a old saying that prevention is better than cure but in heart disease prevention is the only cure because once the heart disease sets in we can only prevent it to progress uh, people who have congestive heart failure or heart blockages they always uh, have that and they are always at a risk of having another event and we are constantly struggling with medicines how to prevent their disease getting worse but it never they are never free of that disease so we we have to focus on prevention we're going to start with the a b c d and a means activity or exercise and we'll talk a little bit about that uh b i'm going to talk about blood pressure control uh, obviously smoking cessation and cholesterol reduction and d would be taking care of diabetes and uh, diet so let's talk about activity and exercise a little so we have to find out a way to promote physical activity we have to indulge in uh whatever our body's limits are whether it is uh, light jogging for 4 miles or just walking across the um the yard to get the mail or walking around the block whatever each one of us can do we should do uh, the american college of cardiology recommends moderate to um slightly strenuous activity for about 150 minutes a week that translates into 30 minutes for 5 days um it is great if you can do that but if you cannot do that the answer is the answer is not no activity the answer is how much ever you can do you should indulge in that kind of activity sitting on a couch does not uh, help at all and as i said a little activity goes a long way so for people who have and i get this asked a lot the doc especially this year that with covid things have changed i have not gotten out i have not been to the gym for the last one year i have not done my water aerobics the answer is always you can start slow uh, and develop our tolerance and it is true that if you start with 5 minutes today i promise in 3 months uh, every one of us will be up to 30 minutes but it's just that initial inertia of rest we got to break and we got to just stay motivated enough to do it for the first one to two weeks we got to make opportunities we uh, at times uh, we got to park our car 
in the farthest parking spot in, in front of Hy-Vee. We got to, if it is only a couple of flights of stairs and there is no rush of time, we got to take stairs, even if it is slowly. So all those opportunities where let's go to, uh, you know, for my older couples, no matter whether it is um, summer or winter, I tell them run an errand in a big grocery store every night. That way, keeping in mind the safety, as long as it's not storming outside, you will at least get in about a thousand, two thousand steps, just even if it is to pick up a gallon of milk. But we got to make opportunities for ourselves to stay active. Obviously, be safe. Uh, you know, it, when it, uh, we live in a part of the country where uh, for two or three months, uh, outdoor activities are not very conducive, but uh, we have to stay safe. Uh, but in general, uh, I try to um, dissuade people uh, about making excuses. We have a reasonably good mall. Our grocery stores are large enough. We can always make opportunities for our, our, us to stay active. Uh, as I showed you, you know, our, um, as compared to 1960 to 2013, an average American is about 24 pounds heavier. Uh, we can see the um, BMI where in 1990s, there was a lot of blue, and you can see that in 2010, there's a lot of red. So, um, you know, thanks to the food we have our, on our shelves, the grocery stores uh, are very busy lifestyles where we tend to rely on fast foods a lot, and, uh, uh, you know, all these things play a small role. So as I said, a moderate to intense physical activity for about 30 to 45 minutes on most of the days recommended, um, you know, and uh, this is what I think we should all believe in. Uh, I always have this picture where, you know, sometimes the, the things which are so bothersome, so apparent, they get your, all your attention and subtle things we tend to ignore. And, uh, the reason I showed you is because the, of the blood pressure control. Um, in general, if we jam our hand in the car door or we have a toothache, even though I can assure you that that fractured pinky or a broken tooth is going to be non-life threatening, it's not going to um, it's not going to take your life from you. We tend to seek medical attention because it, it gets our attention. It is annoying. It is painful. It is, uh, it uh, limits our lifestyle. On the other hand, high blood pressure and high blood cholesterol and, and diabetes are those things which don't cause day-to-day -day, uh, problems, don't cause day-to-day -day issues. And hence, both patients as well as our physicians and the healthcare providers, we are not very aggressive in managing them. The patients are not very aggressive in seeking out advice and healthcare um, visits because of slightly increased blood pressure or barely increased cholesterol. And even the doctor's offices don't lay too much emphasis on that. So that was the idea of showing you, me showing you Julia's picture. So, the first step in controlling your blood pressure is that we should know what our blood pressure is. We should have a very good idea of where I'm at most of the times, and we need to keep a log of it when we are keeping an eye on it. And write those numbers every day when you check your blood pressure and take those, those numbers to your doctor's offices, to cardiologist's offices, because that is what is reflective of your blood pressure uh, range all the time throughout the year. There are people, including myself, whose blood pressure is higher when it is taken at uh, doctor's offices. I don't rock the boat too much typically with one elevated reading because that is not true of your, that is not the true representation of your blood pressure. So the other thing is don't ignore, I, I hear it almost three to four patients every day 
Doug, my blood pressure is in 140s to 150s, but I feel fine. I feel okay, and I don't want to take an extra pill. Well, if you're not controlling it well, we might as well not control it at all. That is the, there is tremendous data which says that the blood pressure to be, uh, or let me rephrase that, to minimize the burden of blood pressure in, or the role of blood pressure in cardiovascular diseases, it has to be optimally controlled. 120 to 125, the higher blood pressure, and 80 to 85, the lower, and the lower is better. Uh, we got to reduce our salt intake. That is another part where uh, I think there is a lot of publicity to this, and uh, I have seen that generally the thought process of our patients these days are turning towards adding less extra salt. With the amount of salt we have in our food, which specifically we sort of the semi-fast food and the preservatives, the meat we take from the grocery stores, and which is already cooked, that is cooked in a large amount of salty water. That's because they want to increase their shelf life. So I tell my patients all the time that there should be no salt shaker at home. Nobody should be adding more salt to the food you buy, which is cooked and prepped in the grocery stores. And when you cook it at home, you should be very stringent, very watchful of how much salt you add. I've already discussed this, if taking treatment in for normal BP. And the last thing is don't make changes yourself. Uh, even if the blood pressure readings have started to normalize with the new regimen, the new medications, you've got to seek a doctor's advice when, you, when to reduce it. And most of the doctors are not pill pushers. They are nothing we say or do is set in stone. If a patient comes back to me and say, Doc, I have made some good lifestyle changes and my blood pressure is sort of running very low, very good. Can I come off the blood pressure pill? Why not? I will definitely give it a try. Um, there is a, um, a, a book out there, and there are some online resources where you can Google dietary approaches to stop hypertension. There's a program called DASH. Um, but again, simple things can go a long way in controlling blood pressure. Um, as I said, cigarette smoking is the leading cause of preventable death and disease in U.S. It is the best intervention ever. Um, any if somebody who is smoking stops smoking, they've already done them the biggest favor, bigger than what I can do them for. I can do it for them. So um, it is it is really commendable. I I know it is not the easiest thing to do. I've heard people fail a lot in their attempts, but uh, my message always is: don't quit quitting. You have to continue to try and make those efforts. Risk of heart attack starts to decrease within 24 hours and significantly decreases in one year. Uh, in about two, two and a half to three years, it reaches the level of a non-smoker as far as the cardiovascular pathology is concerned. Now, as far as the lung damage is concerned, that is a little more chronic, a little more long-lasting. And at times, people never, if there was significant damage done, they might not ever recover back to normal. But the heart arteries, those plaques, cholesterol plaques, they start to modify um, fairly soon. And this is a big thing. People, a lot of my patients say that, uh, Doc, you ask them, um, what's the best thing you notice? Some people would say, oh, my, my energy has improved, my breathing has improved. A lot of people say, I, I smell good. I, my clothes smell good. My taste is better. So definitely worth a try. Uh, cholesterol and diabetes, um, it should be a part of your annual lab with your GP or your cardiologist. Everyone should get them tested uh, once a year. Uh, we should know our numbers. Uh, it is, um, um, uh, you know, this is, this is a lab which has become mainstream now. Everybody get almost all doctors get it for their patients, and uh, these are the ranges we should shoot for. Um, the only thing worse than finding out that you have one of these conditions is not finding out that you have it. So closing our eyes and not monitoring them is not the best strategy. 
you know, at least get your labs done. If they are high, seek healthcare opinion, seek medication, seek treatment. Uh, obviously, we promote healthy diet a lot. Uh, that does not mean we don't uh, eat protein, we don't eat fats, we don't eat meat. Uh, um, we, we, but we should have a very balanced diet. We should um, have enough amount of veggies, fruits, um, white meat, healthy proteins, uh, dairy products, along with the other carbs and breads and potatoes. So let's let's uh, focus now on a little bit on what are the symptoms, what what happens uh, when somebody has a heart attack. So as I said, um, most of the people who have symptoms from coronary artery disease resulting in a heart attack will have uh, anginal symptoms. And acute anginal episode is um, described as chest pressure, chest pain, somebody sitting on my chest. Um, and there is uh, sometimes the association with physical activity, uh, but sometimes if the heart attack is acute and it involves a 100% blockage, it can happen even at rest, even when people are sleeping or watching TV. Uh, but pressure like chest pain is not the only symptoms. You can have people say shortness of breath, I'm just clammy, I'm lack of energy, dizzy, um, nausea, vomiting, short chest pain, pain between the shoulder blades. I've heard it all, jaw pain. Um, uh, one of my patients in 2016 said, Doc, I thought it is the bad burger I ate yesterday, which, uh, you know, but it was a 100% blocked artery. So um, if, if the, my, my advice typically is that if the symptoms are more than usual, uh, outside what you have when you get a uh, GI bug or something like that, and they are persistent, they are not getting better with your, um, you know, over-the-counter therapy, do not procrastinate it a lot. Do not wait for a week. Uh, seek medical attention within hours to add the max a day or two. So life after a heart attack, well, we should not get disheartened. It is not the end of the world. I have people who uh, I followed them for like five or six years now. Many of them run a BEX. Many of them run uh, half marathons. They have uh, transformed themselves. So uh, it is a beginning of a journey which uh, we will make with you, but uh, your motiv motivation is of paramount importance. Um, lifestyle uh, treatment, medicines, uh, or the intervention we do uh, are uh, are definitely the strategies you want to bank on. But the third, if not more, an equal pillar on which heart disease management stands is healthy lifestyle. And as I said, it is not uh, it is not stressed upon too much, but uh, it has, if not more, at least the same amount of importance as as uh, taking your medications regularly and seeing a doctor. As I said, follow up with your cardiologist uh, regularly and be compliant with medications. Um, there are programs which are there out in the community which help us to um, you know, reach our healthier lifestyle goals, uh, whether they are uh, cooking classes offered by Trinity or rehab programs after a stent or a balloon is placed or people have heart attacks. Uh, all these uh, programs, they are there to help patients, help the general population. Even if you don't have a diagnosed heart pathology, you can still participate in uh, learning about healthier lifestyle, learning about healthier choices, those, uh, you know, it is those cooking classes are open to everyone and anyone. You can enroll yourself and uh, learn how to lead a better, um, healthier life. So please make sure you utilize those uh, community programs. And that is it. Yes, Dr. Singh, thank you for mentioning the cooking classes. So for information uh, for everyone, um, you can go online to our website at unitypoint.org 
and go to the um, uh, put in heart education classes and you'll see the upcoming dates. We have um, a class called Cooking with Heart that we call the fundamental class. Um, and it's six weeks. Uh, we're doing them virtual so you can sit in the comfort of your home and learn about um, how to cook healthier, some easy dishes, and uh, learn a lot about nutrition. We have another class uh, called Cooking with Heart for Diabetes. And then there's a third class that we're offering, Cooking with Heart for Cancer. So lots of options for you. Again, go online and, and check those out. So at this point, if anyone has any questions, um, you can either raise your hand or I can um, unmute you. I see a hand raised. Um, Katie, go ahead. Yep, thanks, Kathy. Um, hey, Dr. Singh, I'm curious if you have recommendations on um, a home-based uh, blood pressure machine. Um, certainly, I think that's a good investment for people to be taking their blood pressure, but I also don't want anybody to get twitchy about um, a result that may not be super accurate. So what do we look for if we want to have a solid, um, reasonably priced, but solid home-based blood pressure machine? Um, so um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So uh, three or four points I want to make. Number one, um, uh, take the blood pressure medicine for your arm. Uh, those wrist ones are not very accurate. Uh, there's the, the radial artery or the artery in the wrist is very small for us to have the, the point exactly over it for it to give um, accurate readings. Second, when you go to a pharmacy, uh, please ask the pharmacist uh, or somebody there to assess, assist you to get the right size cup. Uh, the cuffs range from medium to uh, or medium to all the way double XL, and um, most of the time it has to be the right size cuff for the patient. Um, I typically don't recommend a brand, but only because the one I use, I can throw out a name. It is not that I have any interest in them, but I use a brand called Omron. O M R O N. It is about forty to fifty bucks. You can get it from pretty much any pharmacy. Having said that, you know, I bought it at Costco. Anything which goes over the arm. Um, um, another good idea, which is, which I ask a lot of my patients is, when you buy it within the first couple of days or even a few weeks, take it to your doctor's offices uh, and uh, have, a, have a log of your blood pressure readings there take it to your doctor's office and ask them to compare it with their wall mounted one. Those are the medical grade, typically very accurate and uh, see if there is a remarkable difference. Um, if not, that blood pressure medicine is good. Uh, the general rule of uh, how to interpret readings is that um, we shouldn't be alarmed at one reading, either it is too high or too low as with everything else, with blood pressure too, there are going to be good days and bad days and good readings and bad readings. I typically eliminate um, the top 10% and the bottom 10% of those readings and try to focus on uh, where the average or the median kind of exists and treat that number with medication changes. Um, uh, having said that, if the blood pressure is sky high, like 220 over 110, uh, we shouldn't ignore that, but generally, for to have how to have an idea of how good or accurate our blood pressure control is, uh, patterns are better than individual readings. Thank you. And then, do you recommend that you take your blood pressure in the same arm every time? Like, can it vary between your left arm and right arm? Uh, it should not more than five to ten points. Um, okay. If it does, it is actually indicative of. Uh, uh, even um, uh, that one of your arm arteries has a blockage, so uh, it should not. Um, uh, I typically recommend taking blood pressure uh, in the mornings after your after you have taken your pills about 30 to 45 minutes after the medicines. 
So that is when the blood pressure is to be taken. Um, having said that, there is no harm in if you're just not feeling well, you're feeling lower energy, just surprise yourself every now and then and take a random one. It doesn't really um, hurt to do that. Uh, but generally, as a part of the, uh, to, to have less and less anxiety with measuring blood pressure, if we form it as a part of a routine uh, or put it on a schedule where you take your medicines with breakfast and run an errand or go to your office and the first thing when you get to your office is check your blood pressure and make a log of it. Those kind of routines, they actually fare better. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any questions for Dr. Singh? So I just want to let everyone know that we are going to continue these education sessions. Whoops. I hear. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did someone want to ask a question? We can't hear you, but I see that you're off mute. Okay, so um, maybe we're having some technical difficulty. Um, as I was saying, we are going to continue to offer these education sessions virtually until we get the approval to resume in person, as we used to do, obviously, pre-COVID. So. Um, continue to check back on our website um, to stay current on our offerings. And I, I still see someone that would like to ask a question. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, Dr. Singh, I think that's all the questions. Thank you again for your time this evening. Um, this session has been recorded, so I can email it out to everyone so that um, you can watch it again if you'd like or share it with your friends and family. Thank you, everyone, for joining this evening, and have a good night. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night.